In this video, we'll be discussing operations in modular arithmetic. So in a previous video, we've discussed what modular arithmetic is and how to do the reduction part. In summary, we wanted to take our numbers and find the remainder by dividing by whatever the mod is. And the key is to find that remainder. And one of the very important keys that we found is that m is congruent to zero in mod m. So every time you have a congruence in mod m, you can add, you can subtract multiples of m all you like, and it doesn't change the congruence. Okay, so next we're going to discuss what about actually doing the adding, subtracting, and multiplying in modular arithmetic. And it turns out that adding, subtracting, and multiplying all work exactly the same as they did with real number arithmetic. So everything you've learned from the very first time you learned to add and subtract and multiply also work exactly the same in modular arithmetic. So you can use all of those skills. So for example, you can add both sides of a congruence by 5, or you could subtract both sides by 5. And multiplication is no different. You can multiply both sides by 5, and numbers are still concurrent. So in mod m equations, we can always reduce to the remainder, we'll call it r, and remember that the remainder is always in between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to right before the mod. So if it's mod 7, it would be 0 all the way to 6. And we can do this reducing before or after adding, subtracting, or multiplying. So let's think about that for a moment. You could take whatever number you had and do some addition and get a bigger number and then maybe reduce it down. Or if you like, you could do the reducing before the actual adding. So often, it's better to make the number smaller first, so reduce first, and then afterwards use the operation. Let's do some examples. So in these examples, we're going to be using mod 7 arithmetic and trying to find the remainder. So first up, we have 5 plus 12. So I'm going to write the congruent symbol. That's the triple bar symbol to represent that we're using mod 7 here. And instead of adding 5 plus 12, I'm going to actually take the 12 and subtract 7 from it. Remember, you can add or subtract the mod all you want. So as a result, I get 5 plus 5. So from here, we can add those numbers together to get 10. And then from the 10, I'm going to again take away 7. You can take away the 7 or maybe add it back as many times as you like. So as a result, we get 3. That is the remainder when we take, take the number 5 plus 12 and we divide by 7. Okay, so next up we have 12 minus 16. I'm going to take these numbers and reduce them first before I do the operation. So minus 7 and minus 7 twice for 16, so minus 14. And as a result, I get 5. And I've changed the 16 by subtracting 14, so minus 2. So in this problem, we also got 3 as our final answer. And so I'm writing mod 7 at the end of each of these problems to indicate that each one of these congruent symbols is representing that the remainder is the same in mod 7. So the mod 7 at the end represents each one of those congruents has represented the remainder as the same when we divide by 7. Okay, so in our next problem, we've got 12 times 16. So this is where we really get a benefit of reducing before first. 
So again, the 12 gets hit with a minus 7, the 16 gets hit with a minus 14, and this time, instead of multiplying together 12 times 16 and making some big number, we just have to multiply 5 times 2. So that gives us 10, and just as above, the 10 is the same as 3 in mod 7. Okay, so another example below, we have 11 times 30. So let's try to think of multiples of 7 that are close to these numbers. So 11, we could subtract 7. And multiple of 7 that's close to 30, we could do you know, 14, 21, how about 28? So we'll subtract 28. So as a result here, we get 4 times 2 which is eight. From the eight, I'll take away seven, and I get one in mod seven as my final result. Okay, so next we'll do similar problems, but this time in mod 26. So from 27, we can take away 26, and the 12 is probably fine just the way it is. It's already a remainder, a number from 0 all the way up to 25. The 27 subtracting 26 will give us 1. And then we cube 1 and plus 12. That's another way to write the expression. Continuing to reduce, 1 cubed is 1 plus 12 gives us 13. So notice to find this remainder, we didn't have to do 27 times 27 times 27 three times because we used the advantage to reducing the number first before doing that operation of multiplication three times. Okay, so next up I have 12 minus 30. So from the 30, I'll take away 26, and then we can do the subtraction. We have 12 minus 4, which gives us 8. And this was done in mod 26. And maybe we'll just correct above. We also did that problem in mod 26 before we forget. OK, so our next problem says 12 times 25. So with the 25, even though it already is a remainder, what you could do with the 25 is go ahead and subtract 26. So what this is going to do is take us into the negative land. We'll get 12 multiplied by minus 1. This will give us minus 12 as a result. So in order to get our final answer, we're supposed to have a remainder. Now, remainders can't be negative, but we could take what we have here and add 26 if we like. So from there, we can write our final answer down as positive 14. And we are ready to move on to the next part. So next up, we have 11 times 30. So from the 30, I'm going to take away 26. And this time, I'll be multiplying 11 times 4 to get 44 out of the deal. So 44 is bigger than 26. We can comfortably take away 26 from that. And as a result, we get 18. So our answer this time is 18 in mod 26. So scrolling down, we have one more problem. So this time we got really big numbers terms of 106, 107, 108, all multiplied together. So what we're going to do is again subtract 26 as many times as we like to make this a little bit more of a reasonable calculation. So 26 times 4 is 104. So we'll take away 104 from each of these numbers. And as a result, we're going to get 2 times 3 times 4. So we get 12 times 2, which is 24. So 
So that's our remainder. And notice how quickly that was to do without a calculator. Okay, so the last part of our lecture for today is to work on some addition and multiplication tables in Mod 5, just so we can get a feel of what's different and what's the same versus regular arithmetic. So in Mod 5, every single number that you have to worry about is either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Now even if you don't have one of those numbers looking straight at you, you might have like the number 9, but the number 9 in Mod 5 is congruent to 4. So every number that's out there is one of these numbers in Mod 5. So in a sense, this is really all we have to worry about. So let's start filling in our table. So zero plus anything is gonna give us that anything. And if we add one to the numbers above, we get two, three, four, and one plus four is five, but instead of writing five, I'm gonna write zero. Everything in the table will be a remainder as opposed to a number that represents or is congruent to the remainder. And then in the next row, we'd have two plus two is Four, and then 2 plus 3 is 5, I'm going to write 0, and 2 plus 4 is 6, which reduces to 1 in mod 5. So in the next row, I'm going to write 3 plus 3 is 6, which is 1, plus 4, we would get 2, and then finally at the very bottom of our table, we'd have 4 plus 4, which is 8, and I get 3. So notice as I went through these calculations, I only did the upper triangular portion of the table and that's because we have a nice law called the commutative property. Addition is commutative for regular numbers and if addition also works the same in modular arithmetic, it's just we have this extra ability to change the numbers sometimes, it's also commutative in modular arithmetic. So we can reflect the top part of the table to the bottom part of the table just like that. Okay, so next we're going to work on the multiplication table in mod 5. So 0 multiplied by any number gives us 0. So I'll fill in all of my zeros. 1 multiplied by any number gives us that very number back again. And same goes for mod 5 arithmetic. So 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 3 is 6, which reduces to 1. 2 times 4 is 8, which reduces to 3. 3 times 3 is 9, which reduces to 4. 3 times 4 is 12, which reduces to 2. And then in the very last part of our table, 4 times 4 is 16, which reduces to 1. And again, just because regular multiplication is commutative, Multiplication in modular arithmetic is always commutative as well. It doesn't matter if you're in mod 5 or a different mod, it's still going to be commutative. So the same property holds as above. The top part of the table can reflect over that diagonal into the bottom part of the table. Okay, let's take a moment to think about all of the properties of operations. So if we look at these two tables that we just made, you'll notice that, of course, both of the tables are closed. When you start with 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, you land back in that set, whether you're adding or multiplying, as we discussed. They're also commutative tables, so it doesn't matter what order we write operations in, in modular arithmetic. And the same holds for other mods as well. If we wanted to talk about whether we could move brackets in modular arithmetic, well, the answer is yes, we can move brackets in modular arithmetic. And the reason is because regular addition and regular multiplication allow us to move brackets. Is there an identity? Well, in the top table, we have an identity for 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, repeat. And in the bottom table, 1 is an identity, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, repeat in the respective row and columns. So there is an identity, and 
we can find some inverses. Wherever the identity shows up, we have inverse pairs. So there's all the inverse pairs highlighted. And as a final comment, it is true that multiplication is distributive over addition in modular arithmetic as well as it was in regular arithmetic. Thanks so much for listening to the video, and we'll see you on the next one.